Welcome everyone to the Pearson Business Book Club. My name is Eloise Cook and I'm the publisher for the professional business lists at Pearson. Each month at the book club, we choose a, biz a person, yeah, a Pearson business or personal development book and invite the author on to discuss it. They'll also give a webinar on a key concept from the book. So if you need to leave halfway through, we are recording and the video will be available to watch on demand at the website. So what's our book? this this month our book this month is seven secrets of great leaders by lorraine warren and kate kirk and if you haven't got a copy yet you can buy it at pearson.com and i'm popping that in the chat so that's the link so lorraine is here today um and don't forget you can use the q a function to ask her questions at the end um lorraine how are you doing I'm very well, thank you. How are you, Eloise? Really good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Looks like it's brightening up and we've got a bit less rain. <laughs> yes, at last. <laughs> yes. So um, I will give you a formal introduction, Lorraine. You are the founder and CEO of Cambridge Inner Game Leadership Limited. You've worked with leaders from companies such as Microsoft, Amazon, the University of Cambridge, the NHS and a variety of smaller UK based companies. In Asia, you have over 20 years experience of being the international global leadership teacher and trainer for QQ English, who have offices in Tokyo, Shanghai and Cebu. Am I saying the last one correctly? Cebu, yes. Cebu. Great, great. So so welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining us. It's, it's great to have you on uh, to discuss this book. Well, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Great, great. So I'm going to stop sharing so we can see you properly. Um, so we're going to start with our usual questions. Um, we, we ask authors uh, these three questions every time. So can you tell us why did you want to write this book? Um, that's a great question, Eloise. Um, so there's two reasons why I wanted to write this book. Firstly, I really wanted to make a difference um, to people in leadership roles. Um, as you've mentioned, I mean, I've had the privilege to meet some amazing leaders because I was part of the leadership training team for Cambridge and Again Leadership. And at various times and different circumstances, the leaders themselves began to notice at their monthly trainings through reflection that there were quite stressful situations going on. And it was the tools and techniques we shared on the monthly programme that made the difference and helped them lower and control their stress levels. Um, and um, when they lowered their stress levels, the, um, they increased their fulfilment, happiness, and ultimately their performance. Um, secondly, um, I wanted everyone to be able to have access to these leading self tools and techniques. Um, you know, as, as you know, um, not everyone can afford to join expensive leadership programs or be invited by their HR department. So this is a book you can dip in and out of when needed. So anyone who chooses to can learn um, also what great, great leaders know and get to the top themselves. Fantastic. Yes. I mean, that, that's something we're, we're looking for in all of the books that we publish is to distill all your experience and expertise into something that is a lot cheaper than a course with you directly. But you you know what you're talking about and you know the common pitfalls and questions that people ask. So we've we tried to put that all into the book. And yes, I think it's really useful. Absolutely. Great. Um, and was there anything that surprised you about writing this book? Um, yes, um, because my ultimate goal was to enable readers to dip in and dip out of the book, um, the size of the book needed to be small and light. So realistically, only a few of the modules could be used. Um, and do you know what? We've got so much content um, that, um, that we could use from the leadership syllabus. You know, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And so it was how to, you know, kind of condense it. Um, so what I did, I asked a number of people who had experienced the monthly leadership trainings, what they thought would be important for other leaders to know about. Um, from there, uh, seven parts of the syllabus content 
um, that was the most popular really, um, or was popular with, with so many, um, were chosen, which then became the seven chapters and then became the seven secrets. And so, um, yeah, it was such good fun writing with Kate. So Kate and I then added the introduction and pulling it all together in the final chapter. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's often, yeah, what to exclude and what to include are just as important as each other, aren't they? It was a very hard decision, but in the end, the, the um, you know, the delegates um, from the course, you know, gave us feedback on re when they reflected. That's great. And last question, how do you want readers to feel about reading your book? Um, I want readers to feel empowered. Um, I want the readers to feel that they can enjoy the journey when leading themselves um, and others and organisations, uh, that they can use this small handbook when they need to and be able to dip in and out of the chapters when needed. Um, it's to really use as a tool to help the reader be in the best headspace, um, have a growth leadership mindset or even, a, you know, the growth mindset and basically be the leader that they want to be. Fantastic. Yeah, that sounds sounds empowering just hearing it. <laughs> Great. OK, so it's time for your session, um, how to speak so people listen. Um, don't forget, uh, everyone who's attending, that you can ask Lorraine a question in the Q&A function and we'll, we'll try to get to them at the end. But um, yes, I'll let you take it away, Lorraine. Hey, thank you. So I have a placeholder first, uh, which is very relevant to today. And here we go. Okay, so welcome to this masterclass and it's a real privilege being here with you today. So becoming a, sex, uh, a successful leader starts with learning about yourself and then using that knowledge to better understand and lead others. Um, today, I'm going to discuss secret six, great leaders know the true source of good communication skills and um, looking at the world of neurosensory preferences. Um, so we can learn about how you can ensure uh, that you are heard and listened to. Um, after today's masterclass, um, you will begin to understand what good communication really is and how to get your message across, to speak so peace, people listen. Um, as you probably already know, or you might know, one of the key ingredients of good communication is to be responsible for the message that you are giving others. So when you are speaking, it's important to be aware of the words that you use. So firstly, to get the best out of today's masterclass, um, I would like you to grab a, a, an old fashioned, the old fashioned way, a pen and paper, first of all. Um, once you've got that, um, now we're going to have some fun. And this is our first poll. So look at this slide. And what number do you see in the picture? And yeah, so oh, I can see the poll is six, yeah, nine, it's going up. Excellent. Good. I'll just wait another couple of seconds. Brilliant. So what, what I can see from the poll is that, that we have 41% of people were seeing nines and 59% of people seeing six. Excellent. By the way, either is good. So this is a great example of how two people or how people can see different things. We have two people here um, and they really are seeing, um, you know, two different things at the same time. Um, so we can see, as I've stated, some people thought it was six and some people thought it was nine. Um, 
And either way is good because you're looking through your filters. Um, what I really like about this as well, there's an excellent quote um, underneath it. Um, and it's important for us all to remember this really. Um, when you think about how we see the world, just because you are right does, does not mean I am wrong. And this is the most important bit for me. Um, you just haven't seen life from my side. So um, that, you know, you just haven't seen life from my side. So it's actually about how you see the world and your preference. Um, so let's now go on to the next slide. So what do I mean by preferences? Now, this 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 is again a fun part. Get your pen and paper. So I it's a real life example of preferences. Um, so I want you to write um, your signature um, and your favorite food. You know, um, I'm right handed, so I'm writing it with my right hand. So if you can do that for me now, great. And this is called our preferred writing hand. If you're left-handed, of course, you would have used your left hand. And now, um, what I want um, is you to reflect and think about how the difference is, okay? So your pre preferred hand, how was that? Was it often? So when I when I've done this with other people, often they've said, actually, with my preferred hand, so with me it would be my right hand, um, it was easy, quick, don't have to think about it, completely unconscious. And then when you have to use your non-preferred hand, it gets a bit clunky, um, it gets harder. And you really have to, you know, think about it. Now, that is the difference between your preference. So with me, it's my right hand. Easy. I don't even think about it. Or my non-preferred hand, my non-preference hand. And it's a lot harder. It's, you know, um, I've, I, I just don't, I, you know, you just don't go to your um, non-preferred hand, do you? Unless, of course, you've had an accident and you then have to and you've broken your, your preferred hand. So what what we so that what that means for us really um, is that your preference your your preferred is unconscious easy to do you don't even think about it it is just what it is now how does that reflect on today's masterclass well we're going from there from our handwriting and activity to a little bit of theory. So our brain communicates with us with pictures, sounds, and feelings. So obviously our words come out of our mouth, which are formulated in our brain. Again, um, let's see this in real live action. Um, so uh, I, what I want you to do is I want you to think about, well, first of all, get comfortable in your chair. And I want you to think about your favorite holiday or favorite food that you like to eat in a restaurant or, a, or cook at home. And now I want you to close your eyes and I want you to go back to that time when you were either on your favorite holiday or eating your favorite food. And I want you to see what you can see, hear what you can hear, and feel what you can feel. So see what you can see, hear what you can hear, feel what you can feel. Now, slowly open your eyes, so you're back in the room. Now, when I do that, and when others I've taught on leadership courses, often what comes up, I'll say, what did, you know, what, how did, what was your experience? And they will say, well, actually I saw, I saw a picture. 
um, of me um, on the sand um, and playing with, with my children um, or walking my dog on the sand. And then maybe some of you had pictures and sounds. Um, yeah, I, you know, for me, I always hear the water. Um, very calming for me when I hear the waves in and out. Um, and that's my feeling. It's a feeling of calmness and happiness. So your mind takes in the world around you using your senses. So what you see, what you hear, and what you feel. Um, then there's something else, internal dialogue. Um, theoretically, we call it um, auditory digital, which is really just your internal dialogue. It's, it's when you hear yourself thinking, basically. So pictures, uh, theoretically, we call it a visual, and it's what you see. Sounds, we call it auditory, and what you hear. And feelings, um, we call it theoretically kinesthetic, and it's what you feel. Therefore, your mind processes with pictures, sounds, and feelings. Or we could say visual, what you see, auditory, what you hear, and kinesthetic, what you feel. Um, so your mind processes with pictures, sounds, feelings, and Auditory, auditory digital is our internal dialogue, and this is your logic. So again, how is this relevant? So why would knowing this be useful for you to know as a leader? So example, in sales, if you are communicating with a person with the highest visual preference, that is seeing, then what you have to offer as a business, as an organization, needs to look good. Make sure you have a good brochure and a visually exciting website, including all of the four senses. If you're communicating with a person with a highest auditory preference, that is sound, then what you have to offer needs to be communicated in an auditory way. That is by sounds. You need to talk to the lead decision maker. You need to pick up the phone, um, arrange a video meeting, or if you can, talk to them in person. Uh, if you're communicating with a person with the highest kinesthetic preference, that is feeling, they take in the world around them in a feeling way, then it is better to meet the decision maker in person. If, you, if they meet you, and like you, they are more likely to trust you and the company and you get the buy-in. If you are communicating with a person with high auditory digital preferences, uh, as well as either a kinesthetic, auditory or visual, then they like a bargain. And uh, the proposition needs to make sense. So if this knowledge is all new to you, this may sound, look or feel a bit different to what you're used to. And I want to share with you my one of my favourite quotes. Um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. So why not try something different? Now, we're going to have a look at some data and I'll explain more. Here, here we have some, we have an example um, from a group of leaders on a leadership course. They completed the same Secret Six communication skills quiz. And of course, we can see their results. Um, importantly, the key. So the green digits, the green highlights, um, the green highlights a leader's highest preference score. So this is their preference. So for me, like, I'm right-handed, that was my preference hand. Um, for Yanni, um, her highest preference, where how she takes in the world, um, is K for kinesthetic. Um, okay, so let's have a look. So again, looking at Yanni's data as a high K, kinesthetic, feeling, 
And she's also got a, a high auditory digital. This means, um, sorry, this means he takes in the world in around him in a more feeling and logical way. So looking at the red, that is the lowest preference. So for Yanni, um, his lowest preference is auditory. Then we have three delegates whose highest preference is visual. Christina, Mattia and Tuemo. So Christina and Mattia um, have low preferences in auditory and Tuemo in kinesthetic, but they're all high visuals. So they all take in the, in the world around them in a very visual way. Then we have two delegates whose preference is auditory, Tero and Tommy. Um, so we can see from this small selection of six people that there are different preferred ways for them to communicate. That is the key for you today to take away from this slide. There are different preferred ways for just this small, small group of people to communicate. Their preference is different. So why is this useful as a leader to know this? So becoming a successful leader starts with learning about yourself and then using that knowledge to better understand and lead others. Again, here already we can see how other people are similar or indeed different. And as a leader, you would be able to work with those similarities and differences to increase the chances of you being listened to when speaking. So specifically, how does this link in with speaking so that people listen to your message? And as a leader, your message is understood quickly and concisely. This is the fun part for me, especially. So when you take, when you think about the previous slides data, so Christina, Mattia and Tuermo having the same high visual preference would understand each other more easily because they have the same high preference of visual. The words they would mostly be using in general conversations are see, show, look. Um, it's, the, it's all the visual words. Tero and Tommy have the same auditory preferences. And so they would use auditory words more often um, than the other four, um, especially compared to Christina and Mattia because their lowest score was auditory. Uh, Taro and Tommy, Tommy's go to, to the words that, that they would use would be hear, listen, sounds, resounding, uh, let, uh, let's discuss. Um, and Yanni would, without thinking about it, naturally use the kinesthetic language, the, the feeling language. The words he may use more often would be feel tough, let's get a grasp on this, let's connect. Um, because he is also a high auditory digital, um, logical, he's, he's got a very logical way of, of talking as well. And at the end of um, when he's talking, he may ask, you know, if that makes sense to people. So let's go on and see the examples. So this is an example from Tuermo, high visual and low kinesthetic score, to Yanni, high kinesthetic and quite low visual. The outcome is that Yanni has trouble taking in quickly the message um, that Tuermo is speaking to him, basically. So in, in Tuermo's mind, you can see he's thinking, well, it's crystal clear to me, um, you know, from from Yanni's answer. Um, and he said, can you see what, I, what my idea is? And because, you know, Yanni is, is such a high K, um, it's not going in very, you know, it takes time to sink in when she's listening, or sorry, when he's listening. And, um, you know, in he, he's thinking, well, this guy is really not in touch with, with the reality. 
um, my reality. And and um, he's replies, no, sorry, I, I can't get get a feel for it. So how could Tuermo change his language, become the leader that he has always wanted to be? So here we go. When Tuermo knows Yanni's preference, Tuermo can be flexible with the words and he can be flexible when he speaks to Yanni. Now Yanni can take in the message more easily and respond more quickly. So Yanni is able to listen more efficiently and take in the message that Tuermo is speaking. So you can see here, um, you know, Tuermo is now saying, have you got a feel for this idea? And the answer is, uh, oh, yes, I do have a feel for this idea. And you can see that their internal dialogue is very different now and they're connecting. And um, basically they are, they're in rapport through their words. Here is uh, a very interesting example of how you can say the same message using different communication preferences. We've got the four preferences here. What you see, what you hear, what you feel, and thinking. Um, so, and there's lots more examples um, in Secret Six of the book. So the message from a visual would be, you have, you've shown me a bright idea on how to proceed, and I would like to look into it further. If you, as a leader, you're talking to somebody with a really high auditory preference, um, you could say, you have told me a way to proceed that sounds good and I would like to hear more about it. If you're talking to Yanni, hi K, you would say as a leader, you have handed me a way to proceed that is on solid ground and I would like to get more of a feel for it. And then just popping in the AD, um, is um, you have provided me with a way to proceed that makes sense and I would like to have more information. So this is a way that you can say the same message to speak the same mes message, but you can be flexible for the person that is listening so that they can listen to your message more easily. Um, okay, so now a bit more fun for everyone in the book. Uh, we also have some preference uh, translation exercises for you. So here we have some examples. So a quick poll, right? On, so in the chat box, if you think the first example, so the first example is that idea was not a solid one. So do you think it's visual, auditory, kinesthetic or AD? I'm going to give you five seconds for the poll. OK, excellent. So we have 26 percent that thinks it's visual. 3% auditory, 65% kinesthetic, and 6% AD. Okay, so well done, the kinesthetic. This is kinesthetic, solid. So this is something that you can grasp, that, that you can hold. Um, so well done. And the, you know, practice makes perfect. And as I've um, explained, um, we have lots and lots of examples in Secret Six. And, um, and also it's really, it's, it's really important um, to understand um, that, you know, if, when this is your first time, um, you're going through a learning process anyway, and um, that you are um, unconsciously incompetent if this is your first time at it. Um, so, and it's going through that process of becoming unconsciously competent with practice. So now I want you to uh, look at the other example sentences below and note, and now using your pen and paper, um, I want you to think about those communication preferences um, below the trans for the translation exercise. 
And I'm going to give you just five seconds just to write down what do you think. And I'm going to explain in the next slide what they are. So that idea seemed rather hazy to me. That idea doesn't sound good to me. I can't consider that idea at all. OK, so here we go. So if you got all three of them right, well done. I applaud you. Um, I didn't when I first started learning this myself and practicing. It took a lot of a lot of practice. And, um, you know, I um, I had a long I had a sheet of columns with different words that I could look at. They're all in the book. So was it easy or more difficult than you thought? Um, again, remember, we have lots of practice and uh, practice uh, exercises to help you within this book. So I wanted to share this story with you um, again about um, how this could be useful for you as a leader of an organisation or, you know, in another way. So I worked uh, with a company in London a few years ago and um, they asked me to have a look at their website um, to see if it could be improved using this theory. And what I saw, what I noticed was that they, they hardly had any auditory or kinesthetic language um, words within their website. So the web, so when I did a bit more investigating and work with their web designers, what came out of it was that um, all the web designers were highly visual and auditory digital. That means they processed in pictures and information. So they had lots, they had lots of pictures of scenery, lots of information, which of course is important. However, um, they left out um, kinesthetic language um, and they hardly had any auditory um, music or members of their team um, explaining information. Um, so this would have meant that they may have lost customers whose strong preference was kinesthetic or auditory. Very important um, when you are communicating what you are selling, um, you know, to others, to your customers. So in work, you can now use what other leaders use to get to the top. So um, it must be the teacher in me. Um, so um, I wanted to leave you with an activity, um, a task, if you will. Um, and I like, it's a really easy task, but a very good way to reinforce this new learning. And the task is to make a note of any visual, kinesthetic, auditory um, and internal dialogue words. And the, the easiest way to do this is just to pick out a random email that you receive. Um, and, you know, just just um, look at the list that's in the book and, um, you know, you may um, get a, an idea of if that person is a high visual, kinesthetic or auditory. Another way, of course, which is really good fun is, is when you're listening to people talking, you, you, you know, you. So the feedback I had from um, the people on the course is that they, you know, they'd never thought of this before, they'd never done it, but all of a sudden things became quite clear uh, because people do use words that are linked to their, their um, sensory preferences. And, and of course that naturally just comes out, you know, they're thinking in a visual way. So they use the words in a visual way, although using visual words. So um, have, a lot of fun uh, and do let me know how you get on. Um, you know, I'd be, I'm really interested to, to, to uh, you know, to, to see um, uh, how you get on. 
So to end, uh, I wanted to end with discussing um, a little bit more about the other secrets. So today we've looked at secret six, but there is secret one. And so we start with mindfulness. We discover how evidence from neuroscience confirms that mindfulness creates beneficial changes in the brain. Uh, in the book, we also explore how mindfulness can be a practical tool in the workplace as you develop internal resilience and set an example as a leader. Next secret two, we have powerful attention, which is key to working smarter, being more resource resourceful and creative and learning how to switch on the flow. We explain why multitasking is a, tr is a trap and should be avoided at all costs. Secret three, we have emotional control. We explain where you learn how to respond rather than react to what is going on around you. You'll notice a big difference when you lead your reactions rather than letting your reactions lead you. Secret four is all about motivation. And we've got some really fun quizzes in there and tasks for you to do to find out um, your own motivators. And it is often assumed um, that motivators are, your motivators are based on simple black and white scenarios, such as my money or power. However, the picture is far more complex and relates back to your own personal values and how those values might lead to you feeling demotivated in some situations. Understanding the roots of your own motivation will help you recognize what motivates others and will enable you to bring, them, uh, bring out the best in them. Also, um, obviously, we have values for companies, for organizations. So it's quite interesting to see if your values, um, if your motivators line up with the company's motivators. Secret five is all about understanding that we all have good days and bad days and identify what triggers them and learn a simple method to help you reframe your thoughts and switch from being on the back foot to being on the front foot as you claim agency to take control. Today, we looked at the world of neurosensory preferences. I've got a master's in applied linguistics, so of course the words you know, really excite me. But the most important thing um, is it's about how you can be heard by everyone in your team rather than feeling that you're speaking sometimes to a brick wall. I mean, I, I have um, up to 30 people in my team that I lead. And um, this has come just so it's been so important to me. Um, and I use this all the time. Um, to, to communicate well um, with um, with my team, and especially my managers. And um, you'll understand what good communication really is and how to get your message across so that when you speak, a person will listen. Finally, we'll get to the roots of emotional intelligence. This is in Secret 7. That elusive magic ingredient that everyone Everybody thinks they understand, but may not. Um, what you'll do is you'll understand your own particular mix of emotional intelligence, what that means for you as a leader, and how to use that knowledge to better understand others and help them reach their potential. So becoming a successful leader starts with learning about yourself and then using that knowledge to better understand and lead others. There are seven key skills, seven secrets that I've just um, quickly discussed. And once you know yourself deeply through these skills, 
you will be able to spot how other people are similar or indeed different and work with those similarity or similarities and differences to create teams and organizations that are more than just the sum of their parts. So this is not just another book about leadership. This is also a book about you. So it's been a real pleasure working with you today. And um, on our website, you have access to Five Minute Espresso podcasts um, from experienced leaders who share their thoughts, ideas, and how a specific secret has helped them as a leader. Uh, specifically for February, you can hear different podcasts linked with Secret Six. So thank you for being here today. And it's been a real pleasure and privilege sharing with uh, this with you today. And I'm looking forward to um, uh, your questions. So thank you, Eloise. This is the end of today's masterclass. Thank you, Lorraine. That was fantastic. That was really interesting. Uh, lots of nice quizzes for us as well. Um, so yes, um, if anyone wants to ask questions, um, please pop them in the Q&A. Um, we've got a couple already. And I'm going to go with this one first. Um, why did you choose Secret Six to be the topic today? Um, that's a really good question. Um, do you know what? It's because um, I've, I've got a master's in applied linguistics. And um, for me, it's, it was, it's, I find it really good fun to teach. Um, it's, I also found it as a leader um, really, really useful. Um, as I say, um, you know, as I've said, when working with my managers and, um, and with, the, um, with the rest of the team. However, I also dip into, I, I walk the talk. Um, so when I got up this morning, um, you know, I um, did, I practiced my mindfulness. Um, every morning I have at least 15 minutes mindfulness practice um, before I go for a walk um, to get on the front foot. Um, you know, it's, it's about setting your day. For me, it's about setting my day up and the feedback that I've had from other leaders um, is that, you know, using these um, sort of powerful secrets um, really sets them up for the day. Fantastic. Um, here's another one. So uh, this person has a vastly different preference for different types of activities. Is that normal or common? Um, for instance, if they're working on sort of mathematical calculations, they are visual, uh, but if they're working on um, logic-based math, uh, they are auditory. Um, and if they're working on mathematical theory or proofs, then they are kinesthetic. Oh, well, again, a very good question. Um, so um, I, I can give you, uh, for instance, um, a lot of musicians are auditory, are really high auditory. Um, I've worked with, um, so um, a great, great deal of um, professors um, that I've worked with are very high AD. So that means logical. Um, when they're when people are writing research papers, you are tapping into your logical brain. However, because you just because you are highly logical, you still have a different preference, um, maybe a kinesthetic, auditory, or visual. Um, so um, I know, for instance, um, I work with a I work with twenty. Um, people who were uh, website designers, oh my God, their visual was off the scale. <laughs> so you take, do you know what, it's, it's funny. So what I, what I tended to, to uh, the feedback from this was that often you'll go into a profession that is your preference or you know, you're, you're, you're good at, um, so I know a friend, um, who um, he's a fantastic, um, you know, guitarist. His auditory is is just so high. Um, he hears things because my auditory is very low. He hears things that I don't hear. <laughs> 
it's you know it's just it's I don't take in the world around me like that but he does I hope that helps answer that question yes yes that's very useful um and here's a similar one so can learning approaches change through life or are they set um and people can't change their style oh well you know I mean we all we all have um we all dip in to the four styles you know none of us are just completely auditory you know we all have the visual auditory uh kinesthetic and ad but it's what you prefer to do so yes you you absolutely can the best way is um to actually you know start doing the task because that will then get a person used to actually hearing um, different types of words. If, does that make sense? Yes, yes. Um, here's another one. Um, what language do you use when you're talking to a group of people who may require a variety of styles? Well, all of them. Mm. <laughs> you know, so going going back to um, kind of you know you dip you actually dip in, and um, so I, when I'm when I'm I'm talking to a team, I'll make sure that the most important part of the message, I'm using all the four um, kind of different the visual auditory kinesthetic. And AD. So, for instance, um, if you're giving a presentation, make sure that you've got data. That's for the high ADs. Make sure um, that you've got perhaps um, you know a, a, you know a video in there, um, or some auditory for the high um, you know sort of for sounds for the high auditories. Um, visuals um, is normally quite easy because you know that's that's kind of like the slides. The kinesthetic. Um, it's about being approachable, you know, it's about getting them on board um, um, because um, it's the it's the people that they are going to connect with um, rather than maybe the product. It's the people that are giving the presentation or saying, telling the message, just being aware that there are people out there that need that to connect. Got it, got it. And here's some nice feedback. Um, they, this person learned many valuable tools from the book. They've also learned the phrase, does what it says on the tin. So that, that, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> we use that a lot in uh, British English, don't we? We do. <laughs> uh, here's another one. You didn't mention the R in VARK, reading, writing. What are your thoughts on how to appeal to the R's? Uh, so, so sorry, is that re reading and writing? It's reading and writing. Um, well, um, so it, what context is that specifically in? Does, is there any more information? Yeah, so um, Lu um, Louise, if you want to add more, but I, I think um, there's another sort of um, school of thought that as well as visual, auditory, kinesthetic, reading, writing is the fourth component. Uh, well, I would say, well, in education, it's reading, writing, listening and speaking, isn't it? Mm. Um, so uh, with uh, what we're talking about, neuroscience, our senses is um, is about seeing here. So seeing with our eyes, hearing with our ears, um, a feeling with our touch and internal dialogue. So um, obviously you can notice um, what senses are being used or what a preference from somebody's sense is by reading um, an email, um, uh, writing. If you, if you wrote out uh, yourself, you could get maybe a sense of what your preference is. Okay, well, Louise, if you have um, more, um, please come back to us on that um, and we'll see if we can clarify. Um, here's another. During an interview, as an interviewee, what language is best to use? Um, okay, so um, if you are in doubt, um, then 
um, I think it's probably um, best to use all four. If you can, if you can use all four of the language, you are, and then whoever you're with, you will see a spark of recognition, and that will indicate what their preferred language is. Super. That does uh, lead us on to a, a very similar question, actually. Are there any sort of quick ways to understand what a person's communication preference is um, when you've just met them? Um, well, it's, it's it's actually listening to them or, you know, reading to their, reading their emails, Take, taking note of, of their style. Well, that, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's all about the other person, isn't it? So going back, um, you know, we are responsible for our communication ourselves. We're also responsible for listening and um, how we are going to communicate um, our message to the other person. Master. And what would you say are the benefits to getting to know your own communication preferences if you didn't know already? Um, well, firstly, um, you know your habits. So um, I have, so I'm a high K and a high AD. And the first, you know, when I found out this, oh my goodness, the, the kinesthetic words I used all the time. So, so how are you feeling today? And to, and, and honestly, I was working with a high visual and he, and he, he said, um, you know, I, I said, you know, how does, how does that make you feel um, when you, you know, when, then when this is happening? And he went, what do you mean? <laughs> and I went, and to me, it made complete sense. And um, to this, uh, you know, um, web, 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 website developer, I, I thought, oh, crikey, I'm using my own language. So I said, so, so what do you see, um, you know, when this happens? He went, oh, okay, yeah, ba 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 ba, and he then answered. So yeah, um, I mean, it's it's so useful, um, especially if someone you're talking to isn't really getting your message and it mm. may be because their preference is their look is so so I then knew um that and and actually the person I was working with uh did this quiz and he had a really low kinesthetic preference and a high extremely high visual and so and 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 um, so it was so much easier for me then to realise that I needed to focus on kind of like high visual language rather than me automatically go into kinesthetic. So, you know, that just just that was so useful for me. And it's I mean, this was a few years ago now and it's it's been useful ever since. Fantastic. Right. Right, so I'm going to just share my screen. Da, 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 da. So you mentioned the book's website, Lorraine. Um, so it's www.innergameleadership.com and you've got episodes of the, the podcast available on there and some, some other bits for, for people if they're interested. Um, and people can also connect with you on LinkedIn and Facebook. Yes. And, um, you know, it's very exciting. Um, so I've, with the podcast, um, I wanted to round it up um, so that other leaders, once they had read one of the secrets, they chose um, their favourite secret. Um, they read it and then they've applied it within their workplace. And it's actual, um, you know, um, references and tips on how to use that secret. So this is going to be, coming out once a month, different podcasts. And um, so for all the high auditories, um, wow, they're going to love it. <laughs> and this is this is why, you know, I've put the podcasts in because, um, you know, often the auditories are left out. And um, but, you know, even though I'm a high K, um, I've, you know, um, I, I'm now listening to podcasts when I go for a walk first thing in the morning. And what I wanted to do with the podcast are only between five and 10 minutes. So you can just, again, it's like the book, you can dip in and you can dip out. That's it. Yeah, five, five to 10 minutes sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> 
Great. Okay, so thank you so much for your webinar, Lorraine. And um, please do buy the book um, if you are interested and you want to learn more about the other secrets. Yeah, and if anybody's got any questions or anything, you know, after looking at the website, um, you know, I'll be happy to help where I can. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so what's coming up next month? So our next session is on Tuesday, the 26th of March um, at 2 p.m. UK time. And our business book of the month is The Nine Types of Difficult People by Nick Robinson. And his webinar is The Way to Manage Difficult People, Strategies for Success at Work. So that sounds very useful. Um, thank you, everyone, um, and hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great day, everyone. Yes, yes. Have a great day.